You know, by the time the mid-1970s came around, this uh, Hollywood actor was hiding one of the biggest secrets in Tinseltown that ever got out and might ruin his career and could have were it not for him naming names and providing evidence to the FBI about his dealings. Now, when Rodney McDowell was literally busted by the FBI for an illegal pirating ring, uh, give or take, uh, a lot of people thought it was going to be the end of his career. And when it finally came out, it wasn't the end of his career, but he got blacklisted partially by those in Hollywood either named or named by association. Now, today we're going to be talking about the infamous Rodney McDowell case by quoting from uh, a great website. Check it out, mentalfloss, M-E-N-T-A-L floss.com. Uh, and the title of the article is, When Rodney McDowell was busted by the FBI, for pirating films. Now, I guess, according to my research, Errol Flynn's, well, part of Errol Flynn's connection, collection was part of it. Now, uh, according to the article, in a report dated July 22nd, 75, the FBI recorded the details behind one of the biggest raids of a pirated movie collection in the agency's history. The previous December, 1974, agents had descended on an Auckland home in North Hollywood and seized more than 160 film canisters and more than 1,000 video cassettes from the garage, all unlawfully copied for use in private screenings. The FBI estimated the collection to be worth more than $5 million at the time, which would be probably close to $40 million now. After boxes of films were hauled out of the home and into FBI vehicles, the owner of the collection was interviewed. Rather than face serious charges, McDowell agreed to inform investigators about how he acquired his library and who else he knew that might be in possession of some of goods. Now he told him to film Joint starring James Dean had been given to him by the film's co-star Rock Hudson. Arthur P. Jacobs, who was the producer of the long-running Plan of the Apes film series, was another source, as, of course, McDowell played uh, at least uh, two characters, uh, different characters in the movies. Other names were redacted in the FBI's official document released to the public, and I think it was Errol Flynn. Now, the source of this one-man uh, analog pirate operation uh, was at the time one pound for pound, one of the most respected actors in Hollywood. And were it not for a clerical error, you would have won a supporting uh, actor Oscar for uh, Cleopatra. Now, according to a report, and while the criminal record will remain clean, his willingness to out other celebrity movie collectors would come at considerable personal costs. Now, Although the Motion Picture Association of America had fought its biggest battles against copyright infringement in the age of broadband file sharing, which was just uh, uh, about 15 years ago, film piracy was a, was a problem long before anyone was wired for, wired for Internet access. In the 1920s, exhibitors tried to get away with cutting studios out of share by screening films past the agreed about upon distribution windows. Projectionists would all sometimes make duplicate prints from originals, selling them for a profit. By the 1960s, consumer-used camcorders were being served and deputily brought into theaters to point directly at the screen, a practice that endured for decades. Now, fed up with the theft of their content, which may have cost them an estimated billion dollars in revenue annually, the studio-backed MPA began a vigorous fight against infringement in the early 1970s. Bootleg sellers were cornered and litigated. If the government could prove the profit from the sale of a bootleg film, which could carry a price tag in hundreds of dollars, fines and jail time were put on the table. It's possible the MPAA and the FBI didn't stop to consider that some sizable collections would be found inside the industry's own inner circle. But actors, producers, and studio personnel had something that conventional pirates had a difficult time accessing, original high-quality prints of major studio films. Some would be loaned to talent for private screenings and then return. Others could be purchased outright, although never for duplication purchases. Now, in a written statement handed over the FBI, McDowell said he had been collecting prints since the 1960s when the actor had the money and means to begin acquiring personal copies of Bowie's favorite films and those and many of those he had personally appeared in. The object, he explained, was to study the performances of other actors and to guard against the possibility that some might wind up being lost in the neglect or age. The latter was not an unfounded fear. Studios had been notoriously negligent in film preservation in the early part of the century. Now, McDowell, McDowell eventually ended up with some 337 different films, many of which he transferred to cassette for easier storage and the belief he might be better preserved that way. Uh, 
Since his collection predates the mid-70s introductions of VHS and Betamax, according to published sources, it's possible to use Sony's U-Matic magnetic tape technology, an expensive early format that never caught on with the general public. When McDowell grew tired of a certain film, he would sell it to a fellow collector, generally for whatever price he recalled paying for it in the first place. Three unnamed films he wrote once cost him a total of $705. He specifically recalled wanting to own Escape from the Planet of the Apes so that he could have a copy of these characters' death scene. 20th Century Fox offered a sell prints of the Ape series along with How Green Was My Valley. Unhappy with the quality of those films, uh, transfers actually he declined. Instead, the FBI raid found films like By Friend Flicka, Lassie Come Home, and hundreds of others. Rather than face criminal penalties, McDowell started to name names, like Mel Torme, actor Dick Martin, and Rock Hudson were known to be collectors. He also had business dealings with Ray Atherton, a high-profile bootlegger the government had been targeting for some time. His disclosure of those contacts probably saved McDowell from being the first celebrity movie pirate charged with a crime. Now, uh, for the MPA, the resulting seizure of McDowell's collection, the FBI never names its tipster, or what led them to McDowell was significant. In the game of criminal investigation, a well-known party acted like a warning player to the other pirates. Media coverage of McDowell's incident forced bootleggers to burrow further underground, dropping up the prices for films. Now, the FBI didn't pursue Hudson or any other the parties McDowell named. The big fish was Atherton, who was charged by his conviction overturned in 77. Roughly 20 other dealers were indicted, where several were convicted of a conspiracy. The court proceedings were sometimes livened by the appearance of celebrities like Gene Hackman, who testified on behalf of the government to drive home the economic impact of pirated films. But only a few short, short years later, the Supreme Court would rule that videotaping movies and television using home cassette recorders was not copyright infringement, so long as it was used for non-commercial purposes. The decision angered the MPAA, who saw the home video industry as a major threat to box office receipts. Later, they profit handsomely from sales of video cassettes. But it was too late for McDowell. He did escape any criminal trouble, but his reputation in the industry took a, took a short hit because of his willingness to point his finger at his fellow collectors. According to a friend, McDowell was considered by, uh, considered by some a rat and was so crestfallen by the incident that he stopped screening films in his home. His garage empty of the films he had spent well over a decade compiling. They, were, they currently remain the property of the FBI. Now, is Ronnie McDowell a criminal? Mm, no. Is Ronnie McDowell proud of the work he did? Yes, maybe that was a factor behind him doing uh, doing that. But uh, he was so connected in Hollywood, very well-known photographer, a good friend of Elizabeth Taylor, good friend of a lot of people, and uh, and uh, that shall, be, shall not be named in Hollywood. I don't want to get into McDowell's sexuality, but you can do your own research about that. He wasn't busted because of his sexuality. He was busted because he was Ronnie McDowell, because Ronnie McDowell was considered one of the better and the most uh, connected um, thespians of his era because he appeared literally in everything. You know, the Planet of the Apes, Night Gallery, uh, uh, TV shows, a myriad of TV shows, a great performer, uh, played on Broadway, played, uh, played many major roles that uh, en enlivened uh, the, the movies and TV shows he was in. But at the time, this was a true story, ladies and gentlemen, they were looking for somebody to, like a, like a mark, as we say. They weren't going to try to bust Rock Hudson because Rod Sox Hudson was a little more connected. And Rod McDowell was known to be a good friend of Elizabeth Taylor, but the problem is I don't think Elizabeth at the time had as much pull that she had before with uh, Mary to Richard Burton. This was a time where Burton and Taylor were starting to fade away as the power couple. And uh, But Roddy, I mean... Uh, I don't. I don't know what to say because, like I said, he's not a. He's not a bad guy. I've. 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 I've read up on him, and I. I I've seen different stuff. One of the most respected guys in Hollywood. Nobody ever has a bad word to say about Rodney McDowell. If you want to be an actor, watch Ian McKellen. Watch Patrick Stewart. Watch Rodney McDowell. Watch Harold and Mirren. The British style of acting. When I think British actors of great renown, Rodney McDowell comes to mind, and. Just like uh, uh, Joel Gray, the same style. Uh, just like uh, oh man, actually uh, Michael Constantine who passed away recently. That style of acting is pretty well out. What you see 
you see their their personality of the real life individual on the screen within the fictional character they're playing. Rodney McDowell, from moment one that I saw Planet of the Apes in 1968, I've been a fan of his since I've been a four year old man. It's 52 years. But to know that Rodney McDowell was singled out, a lot of people were doing it in Hollywood, but he was what he called, not say he was out. <laughs> He wasn't out, he basically he was, he was trying not to hide. And I think deep down he was trying to preserve these films or find a way to keep them in the active mind because by the 1970s going on going along, a lot of his movies were being cut. A lot of his movies were out of the public domain. The uh, the film that they were printed on was fading. Uh, you know, like the, 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 the film that would catch fire very easily. MGM had so, uh, sold off a lot of stuff. The studio system was done. And he didn't know where he was going. There was no prediction there was going to be VCRs and Betamax machines within five or six years. Or, you know, reel to reel were just for music. It wasn't for video. And if you did buy, it was just highlights. It was like enormous prices. So that's the story of when Ronnie McDonald was busted by the FBI for collecting the films he appeared in, or the majority of them. So if you like what we're doing here with our screenshots, vintage uh, movie podcast, let us know what a like, comment, or subscribe. And if you uh, if you have any Ronnie McDowell's collection or like to see it, call up the FBI. They, by the way, the Film Preservation Society in the U.S. there, they should contact the FBI to see if there's any films are missing in Ronnie's collection that he can preserve. You never know. Films, uh, you know, the majority of films he appeared in, came came on about 60 years ago 40 to 60 years ago there might be some free ones have a good day bye